Hi everyone, my name is Ralph, a fourth year student of philosophy at the La Salle University, Tasmarinas. This subject is all about philosophy of law. On this video, we will be discussing what law is all about, what constitutes a law, different legal experts or theorists, and their idea of what law is in order to have a better understanding and a clear grasp as far as law is concerned. So let's begin. What makes a society possible is rule following. The rules are part of the package that comes from, in terms of laying bed, very clearly laid out rules. So there are people who will follow laws, but what is important to us, we should also have to have a better understanding of what we are following. One can ask the question, what is the nature of the law that I am following? Now, it is philosophy that can throw a better light on what is the nature of the law, why we are obeying law, what is the justification that law has, and is the justification a correct justification or is it wrong justification? There are things that govern largely the philosophical interest in the relation between the law and morality. Therefore, the practice of law has a lot of explaining to do since it requires much justification and identifying when justification is critically lacking. It is a central task undertaken by legal philosophers. The rule of law is a legal principle the law should govern a nation, as opposed to being governed by arbitrary decision of individual government officials. It primarily refers to the influ influence of and authority of law within society, particularly as a constraint upon behavior, including behavior of government officials. Rule of law implies that every citizen is subject to law, including lawmakers themselves, in this sense. It stands in contrast to an autocracy, dictatorships, or oligarchy, where the rulers are held above the law. Lack of the rule of law can be found in both democracies and dictatorships. For example, because of neglect or ignorance of the law, and the rule is more apt to decay if a government has insufficient corrective mechanism for restoring it. The establishment of constitutional government is a requirement of rule of law because of the idea that the government should not exercise its power in an arbitrary manner. Well, therefore, we must understand that the principle that the government must not act above the law in light of key purpose of the rule of law to constrain and regulate the power of government is thus to prevent it from doing whatever it pleases. These purposes presuppose that there are laws placing genuine restriction in the action of government. Still, the adaptation and practice of some basic principles of rule of law are clear barometers for practice of democracy. While there is no set definition of the rule of law encompassing all its characteristics, there is basic realm of common principles. The scholar Raquel Killenfield Belton identified five. First, a government bound by and ruled by law. Second, equality before the law. Third, the establishment of law and order. Fourth, the efficient and predictable application of justice. And fifth, the protection of human rights. So this is the part where principle of rule of law um, ensures the our the innocent that unless proven guilty and the right to on due process. On December 19, 2019, BBC News published a post about President Donald Trump impeachment being the third U.S. president in history to be impeached by the House of Representatives. The House is set to vote on two articles of impeachment. President Donald Trump. The first article charges Trump with criminal abuses of power, including bribing a foreign power, Ukraine, to interfere in the 2020 elections. The second article accuses Trump of obstructing Congress's impeachment investigation by ordering his top aides not to testify and denying 71 documents request despite lawful subpoenas. In our system of laws, people can be charged with a crime with the constitutional guarantee of fair and speedy trial that gives them a chance to prove they are innocent. The law does not say someone cannot be charged unfairly. That happens all the time. It is unfortunate, but it happens because that is how a nation ruled by laws works. It cannot be any other way. Fairness comes into play when you have the right to defend yourself as vigorously as possible before a jury whose members have pledged to decide the case based on the facts. The rule of law is why Donald Trump is being impeached. It's the way and the system that is found in the constitutional works. A government that is not bound by its own laws is by definition lawless. 
without equality before the law. The rule of law is has meaning only for the few. Without political or social order, the law cannot be applied. And slow and arbitrary application of the law means a breakdown of rule of law. So if the law is neither efficient nor predictable, no one can trust its applications nor abide by its rules. So the essential principle that the rule of law must protect human rights has not always accepted but has become an obvious preconditions for any democracy that establishes human rights as a foundation for its constitutional principles. That is why, according to legal theorists Hobbes and Austin, it is impossible for us to have the rule of law. Instead, we should promote sovereignty. Thomas Hobbes, an English political philosopher best known for his masterpiece Leviathan and his contribution to social contract theory, viewed government primarily as a device for ensuring collective security and justified wide-ranging government powers on the basis of self-interest consent of citizens. For Hobbes, it is best if the sovereign is a single person. The concentration of the sovereign power is in the hands of one individual makes its exercise more effective. In the case that is the Libyadan. Those who defend the rule of law and argue that even the sovereign is bound by the law are confused according to him. That's why he used the idea round square as an argument. Another legal theorist by the personality of John Longshaw Austin was one of the most influential British philosopher at his time. Due to his rigorous thought, extraordinary personality, and innovative philosophical method. Like Hobbes, Austin argues that the power of sovereign necessarily without legal limitation and that no legal sanction can attach to the sovereign non-compliance with its commands or rules. For him, the sovereign is necessarily above the law, though not necessarily above public opinion. Austin does not believe that might is right, but he does believe that might sovereignty, and since sovereignty makes positive law, might also makes positive law. For Austin, the concept of law and legal obligation are purely power concepts and not in any respect moral ones. And the source of our legal obligation simply means that one is liable to undesirable consequences at the hands of the sovereign for acting contrary to its command. We'll try to discuss more of us in notion of law later when we proceed to legal positivism. On the other hand, Kant and Madison argue that human had a strong natural inclinations to exempt themselves from the rules and requirements that they were quite willing to impose on everyone else. Such an inclination clearly poses a serious obstacles in the way of establishing rule of law. However, Kant believed that these obstacles posed by our natural inclinations could be largely overcome so that a reasonable approximation of the rule of law was possible. The key was to establish a republican form of government and the essence of republican government was the separation of powers. James Madison was an American statesman, lawyer, diplomat, philosopher, and a founding father who served as the fourth president of the United States from 1809 to 1817. He believed that a practical solution to the problem of obliging the government to control itself involved all the following elements. One, separation of powers. Two, is the representative democracy. James Madison was an American statesman, lawyer, diplomat, philosopher, and a founding father who served as the fourth president of the United States from 1809 to 1817. He believed that the practical solution to the problem of obliging the government to control itself involved all the following elements. 1. Separation of powers. 2. Representative democracy. 3. Check and balance. So therefore, constitutional government have been established. They have not been perfect, but they have abided by the principles of legality to a reasonable approximation. Therefore, rule of law promises important advantages such as helping to prevent arbitrary and corrupt government, to restrain vengeance, and to secure individual liberty and economic prosperity. We have also seen that there seems to be workable, if not perfect, solution to the problem of establishing a government that abides by the principle of legality. The rule of law also helps to protect against oppressions of individual 
by power of private persons and the organizations. It will require that even the wealthiest individual and most powerful corporations abide by law, in both public and private sphere. Rule of law apply equality of all persons before the law or equal subjugation of all class classes with the ordinary laws of the land. Law and morality. So in this topic, we will be discussing two different theories of what is law for naturalist on the one hand and legal positivist on the other hand. There has been a long-standing debate between legal positivism and natural law theorists. First of all, natural law and legal positivism are too extreme on a gliding scale. They both express a fundamentally different idea on what law should be, on how we should organize just behavior. In the case of positivist, law can only be law once it's written down, when it's codified. We need basically legal text to understand how can we organize just behavior. Law is simply what is, while morality is what ought to be. And what law is fundamentally about is the separation between what is and what ought to be. In other words, the legal system is a freestanding system of what is, and it doesn't need to prove its point beyond itself to some other conception like moral system or some theological system in order to justify its independent, autonomous existence and validity. While natural law, on the other hand, reject this contention, they think that law is natural thing that we can figure out through reasoning. It doesn't necessarily have to be written down. For an instance, human rights. We assume that each individual has a fundamentally human right to live a life with dignity. We don't necessarily have to write this down first. We assume that this is just a natural state of affairs. We all simply have human rights for the mere fact that we are human beings. This is in our nature, if so. A law is based on something beyond legal system and that is specifically morality for the naturalist. So they see a close relation between law and morality. They look at law as part of morality, while the legal positivist would see the unnecessary relationship between the two. The purpose of law need not coincide with the objective of morality. So therefore, there, these two are basically two opposing sides in the idea of what is law should be. Throughout years, both interpretations are most of the time being used to create legislation so to maintain order in the society. So what is natural law? According to the text, the natural law is used to refer to those theories that answer the questions in the affirmative. They assert that a necessary connection does exist between law and morality. Natural law theories argue that the law exists with the base of morality and vice versa. While the term legal positivism refers to those theories that answer these questions in a negative manner in which they deny any such necessary connection between law and morality. For Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas was one of the few philosophers to interpret the theology as whole distinguishing the difference between theology and philosophy, by explaining law in general in a detailed account and focusing on kinds of law, which he classified as eternal, human, divine, and natural law. Aquinas' theory of natural law explains that the universe as governed by a single self-consistent and overreaching system of law. The entire system is under the direction and authority of the supreme lawgiver and judge, God. Eternal law consists of those principles of action and motion that God implanted in things in order to enable each thing to perform its proper function in the overall order of the universe. Natural law consists of those principles of eternal law, specific to human beings. Such principles are knowable by our natural power of reasons, and they guide us the, toward what is good for humans. Human law, which for Aquinas term a positive law, consists of rules framed by head of the political community for the common good of its members. In some other cases, such rules are simply logical editors from natural law principles. However, for Aquinas, disobedience would threaten to, to cause social disorder, and so we are obliged to follow and adjust rule in such cases in order to avoid disorder. But such obligation would not be based on any authority posed by the rule. The obligation would derive directly from natural law principle prohibiting actions that threaten scandal or disturbance. For Aquinas, therefore, the purpose of human law is to promote the common good of the community. However, 
there are many current legal and political philosophers rejected this idea. Lon Fuller was a noted ph legal philosopher who criticized legal positivism and defended a secular and procedural form of natural law theory. Fuller was a professor of law at Harvard University for many years, and he is noted in American law for his contributions to both jurisprudence and law of contracts. He argued that any genuine system of law necessarily abides by certain moral principles. He calls these principles the inner morality of the law. A government can control and regulate the conduct of those inside in different ways, but a system of regulation and control is not a system of law unless these principles are satisfied. According to him, law is something intended to regulate and control conduct by means of general rules that are addressed to humans as agent capable of deliberation and choices. Accordingly, legal rules must be applied prospectively rather than retroactively because only prospective rules address humans as agent capable of choices. Similarly, legal rules must be relatively clear in meaning, possible to comply with, adopted in accord with existing rules, and so forth. In other words, for Fuller, a government must give individuals fair warning and abide by the other principles of legality, if it is to show respect for humans as agents capable of choosing their own conduct. Fuller calls for increased recognition of the idea that law is basically a technique of balancing mankind, conflicting objectives. He asserts that law cannot be evaluated in terms of absolutes. On account of this inner morality, Fuller contends that there is a prima facie obligation to obey the rules of any genuine system of positive law. A prima facie obligation is one that can override if it conflicts with more important obligations. Nonetheless, a prima facie obligation imposes a real moral requirement on individual, meaning there is a duty of fidelity to the law. The inner morality of law does not guarantee that every genuine law is just law. And if a law is seriously unjust, the prima facie obligation to obey it may be overridden. After all, a law might be so unjust that fundamental moral obligation required its obedience. Therefore, the epitome of the property of human conduct would find expression in rules predicted as requirement of the morality as aspiration. In Fuller's opinion, the need to ensure an orderly society demands the minimum essentials required for such an objective. Therefore, he argues legal principles formulated to attain this objective should be based upon morality of duty. Fuller finds in all law a unity of purpose, the relegation of human conduct to attain society's objectives. Insisting that all laws have purpose, he maintains that even among diverse societies, there will be a degree of similarity in regards to their laws. Since men are similar, their laws will tend to be alike. Here is Ronald Dworkin an American philosopher, jurist, and scholar of United States constitutional law. Ronald Dworkin was a legal philosopher who really challenged H.L.A. Hart's concept of law, and in doing so, shaped many theoretical debates from the 1970s onwards. Dworkin believed that legal interpretation, when properly carried out, requires the making of moral judgments. It can be seen that legal interpretation in the eyes of Dworkin is actually an objectively rebuild of the law. The law is not just composed of bunches of rules, it is closed and perfect system. Interpretation is only a rebuild to the question of the system. Dworkin's theory of legal interpretation is full of idealism, however, the realization of this ideal is based on certainty and provision of the law and capable judges. The judge cannot be arbitrary when they interpret the law. On the contrary, they are interpreting law constructively under the current scheme and scope of whole law. In other words, his purpose is to make the interpretation become the best based on both current material and scheme. The interpretation is based on participants' view. This decides that it has no neutral standpoint. Constructive interpretation imposes the significance to the object. It decides the interpretation result but does not have the objectivity. According to the viewpoint of law's integrity, Propositions of law are true of the figure in or follow from the principles of justice, fairness, and procedural due process. 
to provide the best constructive interpretation of the community's legal practice. Morality will exercise some significant influence over the way those rules are to be understood and will thereby be in inextricably intertwined with the positive law. The law includes more than those rules that are explicitly adopted as authoritative by the political community. Such rules can be found in statutory codes, judicial decisions, and other official documents. But it is a mistake to stop with the explicit rules in considering what belongs to the law. Such philosophy would consist of moral principles specifying the fundamental purposes of government and the proper relation between government and individual. Under his method, the moral disagreement people have will reverberate in the arena of legal interpretation, producing disputes over what law means and what is right answer are in the hard cases. This invites a deep skepticism about the law. Dworkin counters this sort of skepticism by criticizing one of premises on which it rests, namely, that the existence of disagreement about some matters means that there is no right answer to it. He argues that disagreement does not by itself entail the absence of the right answer. Dworkin distinguishes two distinct types of skepticism and argues that there neither provides good realm for rejecting his theory. He calls them external internal skepticism. External skepticism seeks to cast doubt on the idea that there are right answers when it comes to basic moral questions about our obligations and rights. Internal skepticism does not challenge the existence of right answer in morality, but rather argues that Dworkin's theory is nonetheless insufficient to show that law is more than mere exercise of power by those who control society. Therefore, for Dworkins, different people with different purposes looking at the interpretation will get different views. Someone argued that the legal phenomenon is chaotic, contradictory, and meaningless. But Dworkin did not stop arguing. He gave the law with some significance such as integrity. Law's integrity is standing in the position of the participant in interpreting the law in intrinsic viewpoint. It is important that it only can find some limits from the external viewpoint. Even the critics should not use their own opinion to misinterpret the theory based on different views. Now let's proceed. Now we proceed to another theory of law, the legal positivism. Legal positivism is a school of jurisprudence whose advocates believe that the only legitimate source of law are those written rules, regulations, and principles that have been expressly enacted adopted or recognized by governmental entity or political institution, including administrative, executive, legislative, and judicial bodies. Basically, if a law is written down or issued by a, the authority, it should be followed even if it isn't necessarily justified or ethical, for an instance, that penalty or slavery. The obedience to law, regardless of moral opinion, is seen as necessary to maintain order in the society. The path of the law written by Oliver Wendell Holmes basically explains that if a man does or omits certain things, he will be made to suffer in this or that way by judgment of the court and so of legal rights. For an instance, the duty to keep a contract of common law means a prediction that you must pay damages if you do not keep it and nothing else. If you commit a tort, you are liable to pay a compensatory sum. If you commit a contract, you are liable to pay a compensator compensatory sum unless the promised event comes to pass, and that is all difference. For Holmes, a society of legal system is defined by predicting how the law affects a person, as opposed to considering the ethics of moral underlying the law. So if you want to know the law and nothing else, you must look at it as a bad man, who cares only for the material consequences, which such knowledge enables him to predict, not as a good one, who finds his reason for conduct, whether inside the law or outside of it in the vigorous sanctions of conscience. A bad man's point of view, according to Holmes, described as a legal system devoid of morality, one that not only leaves the law itself impoverished, but promotes immoral behavior by encouraging the bad man to choose a course of conduct not according to generally accepted standards of community behavior, but according to a cost-benefit analysis, in which the bad man chooses to engage in a given activity whenever the benefit of doing exceeds the activity's legal cost. 
unfortunately, Holmes' idea of bad man resulted to misunderstanding and misapplied in several important areas of law, including contract law, tort law, and punitive damages jurisprudence. Holmes' understanding of realism shows his relationship to natural law and natural rights traditions. For Holmes, law and society are always in flux, and courts adjudicate with an eye to law's practical effects. In other words, morality has nothing to do with law. It amounts to little more than a state of mind. So there are no objective standards for determining right and wrong, therefore no simply just answer to legal questions. For Austin, laws are rules laid down by superiors to guide the actions of those under them. Rules are species of command issued by the sovereign. He further defined a command as an intimidation or intimation or expression of a wish to do or forbear from doing something backed up by the power to do harm to the actor in the case he disobeys. Furthermore, the person to whom the command is given is under a duty to obey it, and the threat and threaten harm is defined as sanction. Austin explains laws impose obligation on those to whom they are addressed. Being under an obligation means that a person is liable to have undesirable consequences inflicted on him or her for acting contrary to the command. This is what Austin calls imperative theory of law, which basically explains that some command require the performance of a specific action in a specification. Other require a general kind of action, not limited to any specification. Since laws are general commands, they impose continuing obligation to act in certain ways, not simply on obligation to do specific thing at a specific time. However, there is one promising person who criticized purpose and explaining better understanding on what law should be. His name is Herbert Lionel Adolphus Hart, usually cited as HLA Hart, was a British legal philosopher and a major figure in political and legal philosophy. He was a professor of jurisprudence at Oxford University. His most famous work is The Concept of Law, which has been hailed as the most important work of legal philosophy, written in the 20th century. Therefore, he is considered one of the world's famous legal philosophers in the 20th century alongside Hans Kelsen. He argued that Austinian definition of law is built up from the apparently simple elements of command and habits, the ideas or orders, disobedience, habits, and threats. According to Hart, Austin's definition is inadequate because it does not include the idea of rule. This is the idea of a standard which functions as a reason or justification for doing or not doing certain things. For Hart, Austin command theory of law fails to account some important aspects of legal system. According to Hart, the idea that law consists merely of orders backed by threats is inadequate to explain modern legal system. There are certain types of legal rules cannot be adequately understood as commands. He claimed that there are legal rules very different in nature from rules of criminal law. Thus, some legal rules do not prohibit or require but rather empower individuals to do things that would otherwise be impossible for them to do. Hart calls the legal rules that empower individuals as power conferring rules and he argues that they are less in the nature of orders backed by threats and more in the nature of rules are creating a framework within which individuals can define the scope and limits of their rights, obligations, and liabilities. So therefore Hart argues how that such a theory achieves uniformity at the high price of distorting the true nature of laws. For an instance, the point that of criminal law is to establish certain standards of behavior, which the citizens are expected to conform to. Sanctions are there only as auxiliary measures in case the system breaks down. It is therefore misleading to consider criminal law as directions to officials to apply sanctions. The same logic applies to power conferring rules as well. Among the many ideas developed in HLA Hart, famous and enduring work is the concept of law. It is the distinction between primary and secondary legal rules, where a primary rule governs conduct and a secondary rule allows of the creation, alteration, or extinction of primary rules. The primary rules are obligation which imposes duties and giving liberties to individuals. They represent standard modes of behavior that obligate the members of society to perform or abstain from certain types of action. Meanwhile, secondary rules are rules about rules 
they regulate how other rules are made, changed, applied, and enforced. So first, a society with a legal system must have a rule that singles out the rules that actually do impose obligation that society. Hart calls this the rule of recognition because it helps people recognize the rules under which they will be officially held accountable. A rule of recognition serves a valuable function in helping diminish uncertainty over what the obligation of people in a society are. Second, a society must have rules that specify how the legally valid rules can be changed. These rules help society adopt the, to unchanging condition making it's possible to eliminate old rules and enact new ones. Third, a society must have rules that empower specific individuals to enforce and apply society legal valid rules. These rules help society ensure more effectively that the obligation it imposes on its members are met. Hart calls these three special kinds of rules secondary rule. They are secondary not in the sense of being unimportant but rather in a sense that they could not exist unless there were other kinds of rules, namely rules that impose obligations. Accordingly, he calls that rules impose obligations as the primary rules. These rules restrict violence, theft, and deception. For Hart, then, a legal system is a system that brings together both primary and secondary rules. So, in any functional legal system, the people must generally comply with the legally valid primary rules. The public officials must accept the secondary rules and the primary rules identified by the rule of recognition. This means that the officials must adopt an internal perspective on the primary and secondary rules. They must regard the departures from those rules as something to be criticized. But according to Hart, the rest of the people do not need to have an internal perspective of the primary rules and apply to them. They need to comply with these rules, but they might do so only for the fear of punishment that might be inflicted on them. For Hart, obligations comes from the rules that are enforced. For Austin, obligatory rules are backed by threat of sanctions no matter how feeble. What's the difference? The difference is that Austin is identifying obligation with being threatened with sanction. Well, he believes an obligation is something that a rule requires you to do. As he sees it, the, what the law requires you to do is one thing, while your motivation for complying with the law is something else. What the stop sign says is stop, period. And not because there is a traffic enforcer that in case you get caught, he'll issue a ticket for violating rules. The internal point of view is that the practical attitude of rule acceptance it does not imply that people who accept the rules accept their moral legitimacy, only that they are disposed to guide and evaluate conduct in accordance with the rules. The internal point of view plays four roles in Hart's theory. First, it specifies a particular type of motivation that someone may toward, take toward the, to the law. Second, it constitutes the one of the main existence conditions for social and legal rules. Third, it accounts for the intelligibility of legal practice and discourse. Fourth, it provides a naturalistically acceptable semantics for legal statements. The law is not simply sanction threatening. The law is not simply sanction threatening, directing or predicting, but rather obligation imposing. For hard, a valid legal system requires external convergence and internal acceptance. It is simply not sufficient for public officials to conform to a set of rules in practice. In addition to regularity of behavior, those officials must also subjectively accept the rules as legitimate or perceive them as obligatory. A norm such as a doctrine of consideration must satisfy these two empirical conditions in order to be considered as valid legal form. In other words, social conformity is not enough. Judges must not only apply the rule in cases to which the rule applies, though some judges must also subjectively view the rule as obligatory on them. Hart tries to explain the difference with this distinction between what he calls internal and external point of view on rules. We take the internal point of view on a rule when we apply, when simply follow it. The sign says stop, so I'm stopping. We, we take the external point of view on rule when we use the rule to predict people's behavior. The sign says stop, people who ignore stop signs are often punished. I don't want to be punished, so I'm stopping. The prediction here is that you will be punished for ignoring the sign.
On the article entitled What is Internal Point of View, published by Scott J. Shapiro, he tried to address some of the confusion explained clearly what exactly is the internal point of view, what role does it play in Hart's theory, and how does an adequate appreciation for centrality of internal point of view led to the rejection of sanction-centered theory. The most fundamental distinction that Hart draws is between the practical and theoretical points of view. The practical point of view is that of the insider who must decide how he or she will respond to the law. The theoretical perspective is that of the observer who is often but not necessarily an outsider who studies the social behavior of a group living under the law. With respect to the practical point of view, there are two attitudes the insider can take toward rules, acceptance and non-acceptance. Anyone who accepts the rules is, according to Hart, taken the internal point of view. Anyone who does not accept the rules, either because they are like the bad man and take the practical but not accepting point of view, or because they are merely observing and hence then don't take the practical stance at all, has taken the external point of view. According to Shapiro, Hart's internal point of view is practical attitude of rule acceptance. Hart says that, to accept a social rule is to regard a pattern of behavior as general standard to be followed by the gr group as a whole. It is to treat existence of, of the rule as a reason and justification, for action is the basis for claims, demands, admissions, criticism, or punishment, as establishing the legitimacy of those of these demands and criticism. Given Hart's text description, it is natural to think, therefore, that to take the internal point of view is to believe that the rule is legitimate standard of conduct, where legitimacy is understood of as moral legitimacy or legitimacy is from the perspective of right reason. For hard, people can have any number of reasons for accepting rules. They may guide with the rule because they think that this in their long-term self-interest to be so committed. The problem with the bad man theories such as Holmes is that they assume that the people are motivated to follow the law solely in order to avoid sanctions rather than for the reason that rule requires such a behavior and the problem about homes the theory is that privileges one type of insider's point of view over another by focusing solely on the perspective of the ba bad man sanction center theories define the other point of view namely the internal point of view out of existence according to shapiro here is jerome new frank was an American legal philosopher, judge, and author who played a leading role in the legal realism movement. Frank's reputation as a jurist was equaled, if not exceeded, by his fame as a legal philosopher. In 1930, he published Law and the Modern Mind. Through this book and his later publication, Frank became known as one of the leading exponents of re legal realism, a movement that flourished during the 1920s and 1930s. Legal realism began as a reaction against analytical positivism with its formalism and em emphasis on logic that, the, that had dominated like legal thought at the turn of the century. And co in contrast to the positivists who claimed that judges could apply known rules to the available facts and arrive with a certain at their decisions, Frank stresses that uncertainty and the decision-making process. He argued that psychological forces, including personal biases, buried so deep in the unconscious that the judge was unaware of their existence might influence the decision. Frank was also troubled by the difficulty of determining what was a fact and what was not. He observed that courts received their information months or even years after events occurred from witnesses, who may be biased or may simply lack complete knowledge of the events they, account, they recount. The possibility that an innocent person might be convicted worried Frank and led him to suggest reform in the methods uh, for ascertaining certain facts. The idea of Frank's concept of basic legal myth basically explained that judges do not produce the law, but rather deducing legal conclusions from premises that are substantially unchanging. The end result of such myth making is what Frank calls rule of fetishism. Whenever an object is unduly worshipped, it becomes a fetish. And in the case of legal philosophy, the, the worship of mechanical legal rules had led to an illusory sense of reality and a complete inability to cope with what the law really is. Frank proposed that judicial decisions were motivated primarily by the influence of psychological factors on the individual judge. Basic legal myths affects judicial decision-making 
value judgment the most value judgments rest upon obscure antecedents so according to him we cannot if we would get rid of emotions in the field of justice the best we can hope for is that the emotions of the judge will become more sensitive more nicely balanced and more subject to his own scrutiny more capable of detailed articulations this would seem a simple thing for intelligent judges to do but not all judges are equally qualified to practice self-limitation of their own actions. It might be more accurately said that the influence of this points of point of view promotes judicial self-delusion and, produ and produces that factual suppression of the judge's personality, which leads to the indirect, unobserved, and harmful effect of this personality on judicial decision. Judges must not only understand themselves, but also human nature in general. What this implies is that the judge should not be not a mere thinking machine, but well-trained, not only in rules of law, but also in the best available methods of psychology. For Frank, law must be predictable and continuous. Frank would prefer to omit the word and clearly state that we, he was talking about what courts do, are expected to do, can do, and ought to do. It is essential that law can be general for without general generality, there could not be equality. And justice requires equality, and that means genera generality. Franks affirmed that rules, whether stated by judges or others, whether in statutes, opinions, or textbooks by learned authors, are not the law, but are only some among many of the sources to which judges go in making the law of the cases tried before them. The law therefore consists of decision not rule, not of rules. If so, then whenever a judge decides a case, he is making law. The law of any case is what the judge decides. Frank urged judges and legal scholars to acknowledge openly and grasp the uncertainties in the law and to think of law pragmatically as tool for human betterment. On the Constitution, here we answer the question, is the rule of law compatible with democracy? Well, based on the text, for many centuries, Western legal and political thinkers held the popular government was incompatible with the rule of law. In this respect, they followed the lead of Plato and Aristotle, both of whom believed that government responsive to the will of the people had a dangerous and ultimately irresistible tendency to flout the rule of law. That was the lesson they saw in the outcome of the trial of their philosophical predecessor, Socrates. For Plato and Aristotle, the unjust conviction of Socrates was symptomatic of a deep flaw in government responsive to the will of the people. The public does not have the discipline and the patience to abide the procedures and requirements of the law. It wants what it wants when it wants it and government under the sway of the public opinion will flout the rule of law when it gets away of something in public wants. In other words, popular government was incompatible with the rule of law. That was the view of Plato and Aristotle at any, any rate. Subsequent history appeared apply to confirm their view. Popular government proved uh, exceedingly vulnerable to factional conflict and domestic strife to destroy the rule of law and rendered them unstable and tumultuous Therefore, the rule of law makes it incompatible with democracy in a sense. However, in the 19th century, popular government had been restricted to relatively compact political communities, but one of the main framers of the constitution, James, by the name James Madison, he argued that the size and heterogeneity of the country could be turned into advantages over previous experiments in popular government. Democracy on that matter. The diversity of interests and viewpoint meant that no one group would constitute a permanent majority and that each group would need to bargain and compromise with other in order to exercise effective political power. Madison and his fellow framers believed that popular government under the rule of law would be possible with a properly designed system of political and legal intuitions. So why is the constitution uh, imperative to the existence of the government under the rule of law? Well, constitution is imperative to the existence of the government under the rule of law due to the following reasons. First, constitution establishes a basic framework of government that serves as a supreme law of the, of the land. 
Such a constitution will make the rule of law more secure. With the framework of government laid out black and white, there would be much less on room for doubt about lawful powers and activities of the government. Second, political power must be dispersed among different branches and departments of the government. Third, the constitution must establish limited government. This meant that the power legitimately held by each branches or department of government must be restricted to those powers granted it by constitution. Fourth, each branch of national government should have powers enabling it to check the other branches if they sought to exceed the limits of their lawful authority. Meaning, the constitution established a system of check and balances. Fifth, the constitution should establish representative government. The president and the member of the congress should be elected by the people in periodic elections. Elections were needed to make government responsive to the will of the people. Sixth, the, adaptation of, the adoption of the constitution should be ultimately left up to the people who would select the like delegates to gather in special constitutional conventions in each state. Last, the constitution should contain an explicit procedure for its own amendments. How does judicial review promote first rule of law? Well, it is necessary for the courts to police the Congress and declare its laws unconstitutional when exceeds of the limit of what the Constitution allows. Otherwise, the risk is too great that Congress will overstep its legal boundaries and tyrannize over the country. The courts must also police the executive branch for the same reason, and for the judiciary to police the legislative and executive branches. Its interpretation of the Constitution must supersede theirs. Another argument made by the proponents of judicial review is based on the contention that the job of interpreting and applying the laws is the job of the courts, not the job of the other branches of the government. Judges are experienced in figuring out how the law applies to the cases and controversies they decide. Well, the Constitution is law, and so the judicial role applies just as much to the question of whether legislative and executive action is consistent with the Constitution as it does to any kind of legal questions. So, so how does judicial review promote democracy? Well, the legal theorist John Ally has developed one influential version of the argument that judicial review is justified because it can promote democracy. He regards that Constitution is a character for democratic form of government. But he sees that throughout American history, an active political process has fallen well short of an ideal democracy. Equally important for Eli, the political process actually resists changes that would make the system a more dramatic one. So how should we interpret unclear provisions of the Constitution? Well, according to Thomas Jefferson, he argued that each branch of the federal government had the final authority to interpret the Constitution as it applied to its own sphere of government. According to him, that is the only way to ensure that three branches, such as executive, legislative, and judiciary, were in fact equal in their powers. Legal thinkers have developed two kinds of arguments in support of their legitimacy of judicial review. First hinges on the claim that judicial review is required to ensure the democratic government operates under the rule of law. Second, the contents that judicial review, when combined with the correct approach to interpreting the Constitution, will promote and more democratic political system. Law. Well, um, describe the utilitarian justification of punishment and discuss the criticism against it. The utilitarian approach to law rests on the idea that the law ought to promote the good of society as a whole. It stems from general ethical theory utilitarianism, which claims that the ultimate principle of morality is the principle of utility, which means one ought always to act so as to promote the greatest happiness for the greater number. Government and individuals alike stand under the basic moral obligation to do what promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. For your utilitarian, if punishment caused pain to the wrongdoers but did nothing else, it could not be justified. It would simply be making matters worse by adding the pain of the wrongdoers to the pain of the victim. The utilitarian aims of punishment promotes gen general deterrence, Punishing wrongdoers helps to deter other potential wrongdoers. Another is called the special deterrence, which refers to the deterrence of the wrongdoers herself. Third, aim is referred to as incapacitation, which is sometimes confused with the special.
special deterrence. It is basically concerning someone who is be being punished for the crime already committed, and it does not have to do with using punishment to create an incentive for him to obey the law in uh, future unlike special deterrence. Last is the idea of rehabilitation, which aims is to change the moral character of the wrongdoer so that it is not necessary to threaten her with punishment in order to obey the law. However, the utilitarian justification for criminal punishment has been subject to many criticism. One of the most persistent is the claim that utilitarianism entails the morally unacceptable notion that innocent persons should sometimes deliberately be punished by the authorities. They argue that any theory that approves of the deliberate punishment of the innocent person on the ground that the greater good of society will be served must be defective and unjust and cannot be ju justified by claiming that it will maximize social happiness. Utilitarian approach fails to treat individuals with the respect they are owed. They argue that each individual has an inherent dignity that makes it wrong to regard his, her mercilessly as a resource for maximizing the total good of society. Well, retribute to this justification of punishment. Well, justice is served when those who are guilty of crimes are punishable, punished for their crimes. It is violated when the innocent are punished. The innocent do not deserve punishment, but the guilty do. Guilty deserve punishment because their actions cause wrongful harm to someone. And the purpose of society's criminal justice system, according to the retributivist, is the, to give the guilty what they deserve. Those principles require that all conduct subject to criminal punishment be defined clearly and unadvanced by society's official institutions. These are the criticism of retributivist. First is morally indifferent conduct, which explains the idea that we should have rule for criminal law because certain conduct merits punishment, not that the conduct merits punishment because it has violated the rule of criminal law. Second is the idea of natural desert, which explains that in any event that any conduct naturally deserves criminal punishment can begin to look dubious and to closer inspection. Retributivist justifications for the criminal law tend to conflate blame, punishment, and criminal punishment. Last is moral blameworthiness on, and the rule of law. The retributivist argument rests on the idea that the criminal is blameworthy for what she has done. This blameworthiness is not merely legal, it is moral. Last, therapeutic model of punishment is uh, the therapeutic model rejects the very idea of criminal ought to be punished. This line of thought can be tracked back to Plato, who argued that it is unjust ever to knowingly inflict harm to anyone. His reasoning was that harming any person makes him worse person, and worse person is even more likely to commit unjust acts. If we understand punishment as infliction of harm in return to some offense or transgression, then the punishment should be rejected in favor of rehabilitation approach. Modern critics of punishment think that criminal and other bad apples are suffering from psychological disorders. Cursing such a disorder requires psychiatric and psychological therapy. And these are the critics of therapeutic models. Some argue that it's practical because we do not really understand human psychology that would be needed for it were to work. The model would also seriously damage the rule of law because it would give virtually uncontrolled discretion to the psychological expert over the liberty and lives of the offenders. The rationale behind this approach implies that persons diagnosed as having criminal personality should be held for treatment even before they commit any crimes. The approach claims that the crime is a symptom of some underlying mental disorder and that society's response should be to treat this order. So in conclusion, when we make choices, then there is always a consequence for our actions. The outcome might bring something positive, something negative, or a mixture of two. Part of the human condition is to go about life without creating physical harm to others, partially because such decisions could also create harm in our lives too. By evaluating all potential consequences, when looking at how the ends justify the means, creating more of a logical, independent, and objective way to determine what right and wrong on a personal level. Thus, when we begin to, ne to compare the positive effects of our action with the negative ones, then we make logical choices about what our next action will be. Even though someone with an outliner moral code might make different choices, the vast majority of the people would look for ways to improve happiness and are simple, straightforward, and inclusive. So before ending, here is one great advice and quote for Plato. 